Okay, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for anyone who might be on the East Coast. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you guys know um, a few logistics. We're going to be, I'm going to be putting you all on mute um, so that uh, we can reduce any ambient noise. Um, but if you have any questions throughout the uh, throughout the whole webinar, uh, feel free to type those questions into the chat window, and we'll. Um, try to address them as we're going through, or uh, we'll be able to address them. We'll have a few minutes at the end to address any additional questions. All right. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, whoops. Uh, I, my name is Valley Hansen. I'm a senior user researcher with Expiro, uh, which just means that I um, typically uh, talk to your end users and the people who are going to be using uh, your software and your applications and your websites uh, to try to figure out what their um, behaviors and motivations and needs and goals are so that we can design a product that uh, that they're going to like. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Kuvion. I am this, a senior UX designer here at Xfiro. Uh, basically, I take uh, the research and work with Valley to um, start developing wireframes, prototypes, and uh, discovering any additional requirements that we might have for projects uh, throughout the life cycle. And uh, we're going to talk a lot today about wireframes and prototypes. That's why we're here. So uh, first, Valley is going to tell us a, a little bit about Xperia. Yeah. So just to give you all a little bit of background about our company, um, we are a UX design consultancy that specializes in uh, complexity and innovation. And basically what that means is that we work in super specialized domains um, and super nuanced industries uh, to try to solve complex problems that need innovative solutions. So things like big data, uh, interactive visualizations, data dependencies, all those kinds of things. So we're typically working, uh, we're not working with kind of standard brochure websites or standard uh, shopping cart type interactions. Um, we're really looking more at problems that uh, don't have set patterns in place or set frameworks in place to uh, first to be solved. So we're we're really focused on um, this this idea of complexity and innovation. Um, and so the things that we do in order to tackle complexity and innovation um, really run the gamut in the in the user experience space. Um, so some of our capabilities include uh, UX strategy user research and testing, content usability, so making sure that um, not just the way it looks is good, but also the, the stuff that you put on your application or your site are, is good and is useful and usable for your users. Um, and we also do things like uh, design pattern libraries for niche domains or niche industries or niche verticals. Um, and we do a lot of training and um, we go all the way through to front end implementation. implementation. Uh, so we really, we really try to get a, a wide breadth of the user experience um, with our with our problem solving. Um, so these are some of our uh, clients that we have worked with in the past. So you can see there's a lot of um, kind of complex complex industries uh, is kind of a theme here. So we're working in spaces like financial software, healthcare tech, um, energy, oil and gas. So um, it's really, it's really a pretty broad range of, um, of complexity. Um, and then just to give you sort of an idea of what our uh, process looks like and what our, uh, you know, kind of um, strategy is for uh, diving into the user experience of a particular industry or a particular application, um, we look at it as sort of this, uh, this stacked experience. And so if you, if you think of this as sort of a foundational uh, um, funnel, inverted funnel going up, um, we start out with the user audience, their needs and goals, their behaviors, their motivations. We're really curious. We want to get right in and, and understand who the users are. We want to talk to them. We want to see what they do, see how they do it, and see what they want. And then from there, we can... Um, Kind of ascertain what the requirements of a specific product or a specific um, application would be. So, what kinds of things are the users going to be wanting to do? What um, what specific users are going to want to do? What specific tasks, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as we move up, we get into um, more structural uh, components like global navigation, information architecture, 
Um, of course, we get into the interaction design, um, designing uh, solutions so that we can put solutions in front of users and see how they <coughs> see how those solutions are faring. And then up to the top here, uh, sort of toward the end of the cycle, um, we get more into content and terminology and visual design. And so it's really a broad, um, a broad but also deep um, kind of dive into into any particular project or product that we're working on. So we'll go ahead and get started into uh, looking at wireframes and prototypes, and um, we're going to touch on kind of our definitions of those and uh, when we like to use them in various situations and various moments throughout the life cycle of a, of a project. So with UX becoming more and more uh, kind of high visibility in uh, not just agency life, but uh, in enterprise level corporations, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about wireframes. A lot of people talk about prototypes. And there's a lot of different um, levels of, of uh, definition on what those are. So when we talk about wireframes, we're talking about a static document that uh, can be used to show anything from just a basic site uh, layout or a screen layout um, all the way up to something that's a little bit more complex and shows um, shows more around the content and, and strategy of a page. And we'll talk uh, more about those differences as well. Uh, it's just some quick examples of what a wireframe might end up looking like. Uh, it could be as simple as being a post-it note that shows you uh, just kind of that, like I said, a real basic site layout, um, maybe showing you where your navigation or, or where placeholder elements might be. Uh, you know. It's, it might be kind of cliche, but yes, we do end up uh, designing sometimes on napkins as well. Um, so you might get those initial ideas uh, at any point or anywhere. Uh, and that's still considered, uh, at least in my definition, to be a, a, a wireframe sketch. Or maybe it's something that we're producing uh, with an editing tool. Um, there's a lot of them out there now. Uh, we use Fireworks in-house. We use Axure for doing more prototyping stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it might have more detail to it, like uh, real content and, and field labels and that type of thing. Um, and we'll use these, uh, for instance, sometimes we'll, we'll use these just to uh, do a quick layout and maybe do an A-B test of uh, different grid layouts for a wireframe. Uh, we'll also sometimes we'll use uh, static wireframes to show uh, user flow through through a process uh, so in this case um, you know this these are the individual steps of uh, how a user would complete a, a targeting exercise for a search so prototypes are going to be interactive and usually what we're doing is we're taking um, individual elements from maybe a, a, a project uh, and maybe a static wireframe that we need to put more uh, kind of demo and interaction around to, to really demonstrate and emulate the way that the final uh, user interaction would work. So real quick, we'll take a look at a couple of uh, examples of prototypes that we've created in the past. Uh, this one here just showing that we've got a really basic layout. There's not a whole lot. Uh, going on as far as the content is concerned. Uh, but what we really wanted to show was the way that the menu would, would operate in this case. So uh, clicking on the little menu hamburger icon would slide out that, that menu there, and then we can close that and it slides back. So again, there's not it's not a really um, complex prototype in this case, but it was useful to show just that one uh, specific interaction. In this case, we're looking at uh, a design that's a little bit more complex. And we're wanting to be able to show that, in this case, uh, the user interactions for going in and editing values, say, in a, um, in a table. 
So I would be able to go in and edit a field or fields in this case. And you'll see that, that uh, the prototype allows that to be updated uh, just as if it were a real working application. So in that case, you know, we were able to allow users to, to kind of interact with that. And we'll talk about how those type of interactions can be useful uh, in a minute. So fidelity is another buzzword that gets thrown around a lot. And uh, in my experience, working from place to place, uh, it can be defined very varied um, depending on who you talk to. So when we talk about low fidelity, uh, usually we are looking at something that's extremely simple. It may just be um, just boxes on, on the screen that just kind of represent placeholders for, for content. Um, there won't be, uh, again, especially if we're looking at wireframes, there won't be any interaction. Uh, but even in prototypes, a lot of times with a really low fidelity prototype, um, they may be more of a click through, whereas you won't have any type of, of animation or anything like that. It's really just to kind of highlight uh, the basic values of a screen or an application and to help to validate broad concepts. Um, very seldom will a low fidelity have any type of real content in there. Uh, it may have uh, placeholder text such as lorem ipsum. Uh, we like to use that a lot. Uh, but it's really there just to kind of put across uh, the functionality of that page and the layout. At the opposite end of that, and there's a lot that goes in between, but the, the high fidelity design uh, is going to be very close to um, being a, a finished thought and a detailed uh, design. The main thing that we're looking at here is we're starting to pull in the really uh, the more details around uh, headers and labels and probably putting in actual content uh, instead of just placeholders. Um, the, uh, we're going to be using a lot of color instead of just grayscale in a high fidelity. Um, and possibly, you know, all of the, um, any, any kind of additional visual assets that we might have, such as stock photography, will get pulled into those, those higher fidelity wireframes and, and prototypes. So it's really meant to kind of give you uh, a really good idea of what that final design, final content is going to be like. Um, and it helps us to prioritize the features within an application. Um, and at this point, we're not just showing the function of the page, but we're really showing a lot more of the form as well. So just some quick uh, examples of, of low fidelity versus high fidelity. Um, again, you're looking at really basic content, uh, not really uh, anything very telling, not a lot of color, um, placeholders for images, uh, you're seeing very really repetitive uh, content text in this case, in this table. Uh, and the, the one, the second one here toward the right, it's a little more uh, higher fidelity. We've got some colors in there for links, um, some highlighted states for navigation, and uh, a little bit more relevant content. But then once we move into a high fidelity, you see we're bringing in that photography, bringing in all of the colors, uh, it becomes really useful for us at this point to be able to um, to make sure that the concepts work with the other design elements that we want to bring in. Uh, we're wanting to make sure that uh, we've got proper contrast um, and that we're not uh, we're not introducing too much into the design uh, from a visual standpoint. Yeah, so um, so now that we've talked a little bit about uh, these two different types of interaction design wireframes and prototypes, um, let's talk a little bit more about where they fit into uh, the product lifecycle. So um, this is a this is kind of a high level bird's eye view of how we think of the product lifecycle itself. Um, so we start out with research and discovery, which includes uh, talking to users, uh, getting getting. Uh, as much data about users as we possibly can, um, and then starting to starting to uh, outline those product requirements. Um, 
on uh, epics and user stories and things like that. And then once we feel like we have a good foundation for um, for where we want to go with the product and where we want to go with design, then we actually start designing. And this, you can see design and validation, which, um, well, design and validation uh, kind of exist in, in a tiny, in a like micro iterative cycle um, in the broader context of this whole iterative cycle, this whole agile, agile cycle. Um, and so design and validation and validation, um, the probably the most common form of validation is user testing, but uh, there's there are a lot of other ways to validate a design. Um, but today uh, we're gonna be talking about user testing primarily. Um, so anyway, design and validation, we're just iteratively designing iteratively testing um, until we feel like we have tweaked the design enough that you know the 80% use case is gonna um, is going to find the design both useful and usable. And then once we feel like we're at that point, we get into development. Um, and so we're implementing the, uh, the designs that we have uh, kind of battle tested with users. And then um, you can see this little uh, bendy arrow uh, indicates the, the agile environment. And so this really, this cycle just kind of continuously uh, starts and, and never really stops actually. Uh, so that's, that's the product life cycle um, at a really high level. Um, so let's break it down uh, by each of the points in that life cycle um, in terms of when we want to use prototypes and when we want to use wireframes. So for research and discovery, um, particularly in the in the very first stage, and so we're, we're just starting on a new product or a new project, uh, wireframes are typically used most often, if at all. So they're used to validate broad concepts um, or big kind of overarching product ideas or product strategy um, with stakeholders and end users. So we can put, we can, as Mark said, we can just even draw draw some boxes and arrows on a post-it note and put it in front of stakeholders, put it in front of users and see what their reaction is, what their gut reaction is, and see whether that product strategy, the overarching ideas are, um, are valid. Um, other ways we can use wireframes uh, in research and discovery are is to identify um, specific product requirements, um, whether, you know, we typically, we often try to take a stab at product requirements, um, a list of product requirements, user epics, user stories, um, and then we can use wireframes again at a really high level to, to kind of determine whether, um, whether those requirements are valid and whether they're gonna be useful for uh, the end user. And then finally, we can also uh, use uh, wireframes to understand our users' mental models of how they would expect to use a product and how they would hope to use a product. Um, prototypes, on the other hand, are best used in that agile environment. And so we're gonna be using prototypes more um, after, the, after the very first sprint or the initial stage of a product's life cycle. So prototypes will be used to put. We're going to put them in front of users again, but um, this is kind of this is more a little bit a little bit more detailed and a little bit more nuanced. And we're looking for more specific requirements that we're trying to get out of the users. With design, um, I mean, obviously, this is where most of our wireframing and prototyping comes into play, and it works uh, as you saw in that high level diagram works very closely in concert with any kind of validation that we might be running, whether that's user testing or surveys or anything else like that. Um, so um, it's uh, the, the level, the fidelity of wireframes versus prototypes and uh, just whether we're using wireframes or prototypes uh, can build, really be determined a lot by the other factors that uh, that we're kind of are kind of feeding into this. So the research uh, portion, and then also development portion. You know, we have to be considering all of that as we're we're starting the design process. But really, we're running wireframes when we're trying out um, a, a different idea or a different design. Um, when we need to kind of quickly uh, demonstrate something. Um, or if we're dealing with, with really more basic type of, of known interactions. So um, especially if we're dealing with uh, an existing client, for instance, who already has um, an established 
pattern library and design standards, uh, we're not going to really have to, to do as much toward demonstrating interactions uh, as we might with, uh, with a more complex or new client. Uh, so with prototypes in the design process, really this is when we, and it, it's, it's becoming more and more uh, important for us when we're dealing with a lot of these complex designs that we do, where we're really needing to uh, get buy-in from stakeholders at this point. Uh, so it's not just the validation with the users, but uh, that internal validation. Um, and if we need to quickly kind of demonstrate or, uh, you know, ex explain through through visual demonstration the, the complex interactions that we might be putting into these applications. Um, so with, with uh, you know, in, in that instance, the prototype is, is going to be a lot better. We're, we're, we want to be looking at, uh, again, high fidelity in, in many cases where uh, we're moving away from just validating placement of content and more validating actual labels um, and you know what those interactive elements are saying to the user. Yeah. And then, um, like I said, that all you know uh, moves right into the the user testing piece. So at that point, you know we start working with someone like Valley, and Valley can talk more about kind of um, how we use the wireframes and prototypes there. Yeah. And so as a user researcher, I have um, really strong opinions about when to use wireframes and when to use prototypes um, during user testing. Uh, sometimes it, sometimes my strong opinions don't always get to, uh, they don't always get to be realized um, due to, you know, things like time, budget, et cetera. Um, but this is the ideal, these are the ideal scenarios for me as a user researcher. So wireframes are best used when we are trying to test, as Mark said, really static things and static things like um, information architecture, navigation, uh, whether, whether um, particular content buckets should contain particular you know, pieces of content. So where basically where information is stored in, this, in a site or an application, um, things like that are good uh, are good to be um, exposed in wireframes. Um, also, validating language and labels. We can talk. We can talk. You know, forever on wireframes about on a static wireframe about content, um, labels, any any kind of uh, textual uh, information that we're that we're trying to display. And we're also able to use wireframes to A B test, um, for example, different feature sets. Uh, whether um, whether a user is going to be more likely to want to use you know, feature X versus feature Y, whether we should prioritize feature X uh, higher than feature Y, et cetera, et cetera. And also um, visual design directions. So this is a great way to, static wireframes are a great way to test, um, you know, colors and colors of buttons and, and color schemes of, you know, the, the, entire, uh, the entire site and the layout and things like that. Um, so we can really get to uh, user preference and user, um, uh, uh, interest on um, using wireframes, but if we want to if we want to get to uh, things like users motivations and users behaviors, then we really want to use prototypes as much as possible. Um, we want to use prototypes when we're trying to uh, show the user how something is going to work, not just how it's going to look. So we want to use prototypes, communicate interactions, allow users to make mistakes. This is so important. We want users to be able to um, kind of back themselves into a corner and then see whether they can back themselves out of it. Um, and so that's really important in terms of figuring out um, workflows and data dependencies and filtering and things like that. Um, and then uh, this third bullet here, this is also really important for prototypes specifically because we can de-risk features and functionality before we send them off to be implemented. So if we show or display an interaction that a user, for a feature that a user is not gonna be likely to use at all, and it's gonna cost uh, gads of money and gads of time to develop, um, Prototypes are a great way to, to de-risk that and, and take out um, take out the uncertainty and the un, um, 
and kind of the scariness of uh, developing this, you know, this cool new feature that might not even be used at all. You know, Valley touches on on something there that we we don't specifically call out in our slides, but um, it's kind of like the the elephant in the room. Um, obviously, wireframes versus prototypes uh, at some point are, are going to come down to uh, budget, and that might be time budget or it might be monetary budget. And uh, it's you know it goes without saying that that creating a prototype. Uh, is going to take some more time uh, and therefore more money than just doing a wireframe. But uh, it's important, the, you know, these things that Valley is pointing out that um, that we argue for prototyping in those instances because of the added value that they give, uh, that they inform us. Uh, and again, I think that that third bullet is a big one where um, you can spend a little bit more money now doing a prototype to get these uh, these answers, uh, or you can spend a lot more money having to redevelop something because it, uh, it wasn't properly tested. So speaking of development, um, a lot of times um, at this point, I'm usually delivering both wireframes and prototypes. Uh, as, as along with some some other documentation as well, um, prototypes are going to be best when you're wanting to demo these features for developers. Um, so a lot of times with uh, with an agile development team, uh, you might be having weekly or biweekly demos depending on the the lengths of your sprints. Um, and you know if if developers are getting in there and they're giving a demo of what they've produced. Uh, it's also a great time for uh, your designers to get in there and to demo uh, what's coming up in future sprints. Uh, it allows you to um, head off any kind of technical issues that might come up uh, with the development team. You know, they're, they're seeing what you're planning on implementing and they can raise red flags before it even gets to that point. Um, so you may still be back in that design phase uh, iterating with with validation and user testing, uh, but you're wanting to have those developers be involved at that point as well. But then once we're actually handing off designs, once we've gone through that, that iteration and that cycle with, with validation and testing, um, you know, it's, it's more times than not, it's gonna be flat wireframes that we're gonna hand off and they're gonna be annotated. So that might be actually on the document, you know, we'll, we'll redline uh, wireframes with annotations um, and uh, interaction notes, that type of thing. Uh, but we also like to produce functional spec documents that get attached to the wireframes on handoff. And those are going to be directly related to any kind of user stories or requirements that have already been um, laid out by the, um, the project managers. Uh, so that everything kind of has, everything falls into place and, um, and the developers have kind of that blueprint and that guideline to go by as they start developing on those designs. So uh, we thought it would be uh, useful to maybe show some examples of some, uh, some usability testing uh, on both the wireframes and prototypes. Now these are really basic and not uh, not necessarily typical of, of the type of uh, more complex enterprise applications that we're working on, uh, but this will give you these will give you an ex a good uh, feel for um, how we can get uh, different types of information based on wireframes or prototypes. Yeah, so Mark and I have uh, designed a fake uh, bicycle training application. Um, to be used by cyclists who are interested in training for um, anything, I guess. Uh, so the first, uh, the first thing we want to look at is we want to look at a wireframe user test versus a prototype user test um, for a basic form workflow. And so let's see. Let's assume you purchased this new product, PaceMate Tour, as a tool to help you train for a race. Um, so use the mouse 
to show me how you get started registering and then walk me through your thought process. Okay. Click on the email address. Okay. And so um, right. once you've typed in your email, you'll see mm -hmm. a little check mark next to the box. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what's your next step from here? Uh, confirm my email, so just type it. Okay. And so, um, tell me what's happened here. Uh, they're inconsistent, so they're not the same, they don't match. Oh, okay, yeah, misspelled typo. Okay, and how do you feel about that? Uh, it's fine. Okay, so what would be your next step from here? Uh, to fix the typo. Okay. Okay. And so, you've typed in your password as well. Right. Um, and what is, uh, why is your password uh, being shown? Uh, the show password checkbox is checked. Okay, and how do you feel about how that works? That's good, I like that. That's good. Okay, and so what would be your next step from here? Um, select my device. Okay. Okay, so how did you feel about that whole process? Yeah, straightforward. It's good. Okay, so. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, our user, our participant um, was able to get through this process with the wireframes. Um, uh, I did have to walk him through, I did kind of have to walk him through uh, the form rather than uh, him walking me through the form. Um, but let's take a look at uh, how it's different if we use an interactive um, prototype for the same, uh, the same exact task. So let's assume that you've purchased this new product, PaceMate Tour, as a tool to help you train for a race. Show me how you'd get started. I would hit this button. Okay. And so walk me through what you're doing. I would assume I'm signing up and putting my info up, so you want me to do that? Yeah, please. Okay. So tell me what's just happened. I made a mistake on the email. I think so. Okay. Okay. Is this uh? So what was your question? What does this button do? So tell me what you would expect it to do. Uh, I would assume it shows what I typed in, but I'm not sure. Okay, so go ahead and click there. Okay, cool, that makes sense. Okay. All right, so what would your next step be from here? I'd hit sign up. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, um, both of our users got through this process with really no problem, but um, we're kind of hearing we're hearing the, the user researcher or me talk more in the, um, in the wireframe user test than in the prototype user test. So the user is really guiding the, uh, the prototype test, whereas the, um, whereas the researcher is essentially guiding the, the wireframe test. And whereas in this case, you know, with, with just a sign up form, um, it was pretty basic. If it were something more complex, uh, you can see where a prototype might actually reveal more complications within the form that uh, we haven't considered. So now we'll look at something a little bit more complex. Um, and this is uh, once these users have actually started using the, de the device, uh, they would get into a, a dashboard screen for interpreting the data that's coming off of it. So we'll take a look first at um, a user just uh, dealing with a static wireframe PDF. Okay, so tell me what this page is showing you. What page have you landed on? Uh, I would assume this is the route I'm taking for the race. Um, that's what it looks like to me. Okay, and so what, other than the route, what other things is this dashboard showing you? Uh, it's telling me uh, what my route is, when I put it in, um, 
it's telling me when I start and finish, how long it is, this is how high up I am when I'm going, um, how fast I'm going, and how fast my heart is beating. Oh, and yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. So how would you expect to be able to interact with this dashboard? I would assume I can change my route up here or my log date, make a new route, get to my profile and information up here, maybe move around on the map. Um, I think that's probably it. Okay. So I want to draw your attention to those um, large white dots on the route. Okay. Um, so tell me what you think those might mean. Um, maybe checkpoints for the race or landmarks, I don't know. Okay. Um, so I want to let you know uh, about the intended functionality of those white dots. Okay. And so um, essentially the idea is that you can hover over or click on those dots and get um, some more information about where you are in your route and the, um, like what your pace was at that particular point, what your heart rate was, etc. Okay. So tell me how you feel about that interaction. I like that. I, I like being able to see that information at a certain point. Uh, I'd like to be able to sort of decide where those points are, but I think that's helpful. Okay, so again, we're seeing more of um, the user kind of telling me what he's doing, what he would want to do or what he would want to see versus showing me. And he's also not able to, you know, move around, interact with the with the static wireframe and really make any um, make any mistakes or, or figure out or kind of explore on his own, um, figure out functionality on his own. So let's take a look now at um, an interactive prototype for the same exact task. Tell me what page we've landed on here. Uh, this is my dashboard. Okay. And what is the dashboard showing you? Um, right now it's showing you my route, um, last route that I did, and uh, distance and uh, time, uh, heart rate, pace, um, elevation, which is nice. That's really cool. Okay. Um, and so how would you expect to be able to interact with this map? Um, with the map itself? Uh, I mean, sorry, the dashboard. With the dashboard? Um, you should be able to change the route, yeah, to different routes. Um, and then this synchronizes them, updates them. Um, and then, oh, that's nice. So tell me what's nice about that. Um, I get figure out where I am at the, at the elevation and speed at that point all the way up. It's really nice. Okay. And then looking at that um, elevation visual, what are the what do those colors mean if you if you hover away from what um, those colors mean too? Speed. Okay. The height is the elevation and then so he doesn't go up the hill, going slower. So yeah. Okay. So what do you think about the way that works? It's nice. It's easy. Okay. So you can see in this interactive prototype, the user is able to um, move around, uh, explore on his own, make mistakes, figure out uh, what things mean without kind of being guided to in any particular way or led in any particular direction. Um, and so, and he's also able to um, kind of identify more, um, kind of interact more and identify more with, with the dashboard itself rather than just being kind of uh, an observer. All right. So again, as Mark said, those two uh, sets of user tests were oversimplifications just to highlight uh, the difference between simplicity and complexity when we're trying to figure out whether we want to do a wireframe or a prototype. So um, again, the, the basic workflow or the basic um, pattern of a login or sign up uh, form really doesn't necessitate a prototype. But then if you get into something more uh, complex and more uh, different from what users are used to, then you definitely want to use a prototype so that you're 
uh, trying to emulate the um, emulate how the how the experience would actually be and really figure out whether really figure out uh, what the user's behaviors will be. Um, so here uh, is a static example of um, one of our current projects that absolutely necessitates prototyping. It's, uh, this example is of a nuclear reactor. It's a large screen multi-touch. So you can see uh, this user here is interacting with a very large screen and he's using both of his hands um, and um, using gestures with both of his hands. And so something like this, which is completely innovative and extremely complex, um, absolutely needs uh, you know, a user, uh, a prototype in order to uh, make sure that we're designing the right gestures and uh, making them the most natural um, interactions for the users. All right, so I think that wraps up um, our uh, slides. Um, so if anyone has any questions or comments, please uh, type them in the chat window and we'll, we'll try our best to answer them. I, I did have one uh, just to get it started. Uh, we've uh, looked at a couple of case studies at the extreme of very complex and very simple. Uh, how do you, you know, in the middle, how do you uh, begin to determine where the tipping point is, where it's warranted versus where it's not warranted to prototype? Um, I, I, I don't know that there's a, a real hard and fast answer to that. I think it, it it's extremely dependent on the project. Uh, it's you know we're we're going to look at uh, you know one of Valley's points there on that on that last one was that you know if if we're if we're introducing new behavior um, then it's it's kind of a given that we're probably going to uh, lean more towards prototyping than we are wireframing. Um, so it's really kind of taking all of those elements in, into, into consideration uh, as we look at a particular page. With, uh, with a large project, we may wireframe a kind of a, a higher level view of, uh, or more of a heuristic or global view, uh, but then we may want to prototype out more of the detail uh, in specific areas. So uh, it, it, the, the, I don't think there's ever a case where we go into a project and it's all low fidelity wireframes or all high fidelity prototypes. Um, you're kind of working with uh, a range across the, the whole field throughout. Okay. All right, um, I think that wraps up our session for the day. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, we hope to see you at future webinars. Thanks a lot.